So this is the IKEA Hensvik wardrobe. It's a semi-modular unit. But this comes as one piece in two boxes. And we're going to be showing the assembly process here very quickly as I kind of back up and we go through the process of the assembly on this. But this is what it looks like done. Uh, this, it has a closet bar, shelves inside. I'd have to double check uh, the prices. I think they usually run in the low twos at, at IKEA, but you know they have sales and stuff like that going on too. So it's a nice little standalone unit. Should take a little under. A, a, a very efficient builder can get this done in an hour. Uh, though don't be surprised if it takes upwards of an hour and a half to complete. Uh, two hours, somebody's slow poking. But I'm also using power tools. And so if somebody does not have power tools available to them, then yeah, it's a two-hour project. So at this stage, just unpack everything, lay it out. And uh, if, you, if you have more than one person working on this project, one of the things you can do at this stage, kind of separate out the hardware that's going to go with the doors with, from the hardware that's going to go on building the cabinet body. Uh, this stuff you may or may not end up using. This is the nails for the rear. This is the stuff for attaching it to a wall, let's say, so that if a child doesn't start climbing the, uh, climbing it or something like that and have it come crashing down. So you can attach this to the wall, it comes with the hardware and everything for it. Um, these are for the shelves, and this is all the cabinet assembly hardware, and that's what I'm going to get on first. But again, if you have more than one person available for the project, then you would separate somebody out to start working on a door separately. Uh, the other thing is to look out when you're unpacking the smaller of the two boxes, there are some small pieces which may look like packing material, but they are actually pieces of the furniture. So you want to keep an eye open for that. Don't throw, don't throw the boxes away until your assembler mostly assembled. So if you have somebody you're working as a group, uh, don't get overly eager about throwing the packaging away until you are 100% certain that you have recovered all of the pieces from the box and at that stage of course you could separate out the cardboard from the foam the cardboard goes to recycle the foam goes to garbage at least here in the United States the manual of course has no um, no wording in here you know it just has some safety stuff and so you get a little bit of a uh, inventory assistance here and the first things first is going to be the assembly of the side pieces. Kia Hensvik, um, it's a two box item, basically a kind of a medium sized armoire or wardrobe type of thing. This particular one is in white, they come in a couple of different colors. Uh, tools required for the assembly on this. I use an impact, I'm also basically going to use my Leatherman tool for the screwdriver stuff. And then there is a point where you would use a hammer to put the back on, uh, you know, because it's like a hammer nail thing. I use a power stapler on that. It tends to work better, faster, more efficiently, um, especially when you're doing something like this for a client. It, it gives a little bit more of a factory uh, built uh, finish, a, a little more solid in, in that sort of thing. And it's, you know, we use like a kind of a cabinet maker staple on that sort of a situation. The uh, way you want to start, you want to get these things kind of laid out on a soft surface, preferably carpet. Here we've got a rug, uh, just kind of make sure that if there's a little bit of debris here, we, we make sure it's nothing sharp or pointy that would, that would damage this stuff as it's being moved around. Like a lot of IKEA furniture, it's most, gen most uh, vulnerable when it's partially assembled, so the other thing you need to consider doing is building this in the room where it's going to go. Uh, you, you, it, this is one of the pieces that can be damaged just by moving it. Uh, but once it's built in a room where it's going to go, everything is going to be relatively uh, secure. So we prefer to build these in the room where it's going to go, not necessarily like, say, build it in a garage and then carry it in. So what we do is we unpack major components, lay them out, and get started. And so in this, you basically want to look very carefully at the diagrams and where the holes are in the diagrams. Because some of these holes get dowels, some of them get these little turn lock bases. You'll need to take those wall mounts apart. I'm going to install the wall mounts. We 
may or may not use them in this, but it's good to install them when you're first putting the furniture together so that that option is available later when uh, somebody may want to use that furniture attached to a wall at a later date. The other thing, if it gets a little tweaked and weak from being moved, you can salvage a little bit of that back when you um, bolt it to a wall. The other thing is, like in a lot of common house situations, there's trim along the floor. And that's what makes these things a little tricky to bolt to the wall because there's trim. So you may have to put a, a, do a little bit of carpentry and put some spacer wood behind that. And the thickness of that spacer wood is going to depend a little bit on the, uh, the carpentry and the trim in the house that it's going in. So with regard to these things, we look at the diagram and we determine where these are going to go. Now usually the way this works is little turn locks will go in the ones that have the slightly smaller hole and a dowel will go in the ones that have a slightly larger hole. If you have any questions about that, just look a little bit more carefully at the diagram. So as, it, as I get these turn locks installed, they're basically going to go around the perimeter because they hold the uh, shelving together or the, the, the bo body of the thing together. They also go in some of the trim here, which is going to be hold by the t held by the turn locks and some dowels. Again, if it's got a slightly larger hole, that's where dowel will go. If it's got the slightly smaller hole, that's where you can screw these in. You don't get, want to get overly aggressive with the uh, impact driver, and they say you can do it with just a drill or a hand screwdriver, and what I'm finding is the impact is a lot better. Uh, doing it with a hand screwdriver can actually cause damage to the stuff. And if it does, you know, if you get a little davit that gets pulled out of one, hopefully you can turn it in deep enough that it holds and you'll be okay. But it, it really is better to use an impact. And if you do use an impact, it doesn't need to be a full power 18 volt unit. You know, it can be one of the Hitachi 10.8s or one of the many 12 volt units out there. On these wall mount things, you notice that there's multiple holes in that. You want it where this larger hole, however you do it, ends up where it's going to be flush of the back after you attach that back. Okay, so that's going to go there. If we were to use that, that's, it's going to go here. If we were going to use this hole, it would be spaced in too far and it wouldn't work right. So just look at the positioning on holes there in case there's any ambiguity about that. Although it does read it that way in the instructions. The other thing we're going to look at is the positioning and spacing on the hinge mounts. Here we see them at the extreme top and the extreme bottom. Because there's multiple holes here, they have to do with the positioning of uh, have to do with the positioning of shelves. We, we it can be a little confusing on this as we look at the diagram. We see that there's a one, two, three hole. We see that this is going to be the bottom where it has some feet. And that these line up on the two and the three hole at the bottom. The other thing we look at is there's a little tail on here with a screw. A little tail with a screw goes inward. It goes in, uh, inboard on the piece. And what I have is these things two. These two sides are faced with the fronts facing each other. So the bare side is where we're going to be nailing, uh, nailing the back on. Although in my assembly we do it with stapling. And that's the positioning on this stuff. So you notice that one, two, three hole, we're using the two and a three hole, which is emphasized in the instructions with a downward bias is the other way to look at it. It's the upper set with a downward bias, and if you were to measure everything out and compare it to the positions of the mounting holes on the doors, that's basically in the middle of the piece. The thing to keep in mind in order to save yourself some grief later on, these come with the screws already in them. Basically already started, there's like a little, uh, on the fancier one there's a little plastic filler piece. They come with the screws already started. As soon as you start turning those on these, they loosen up a little bit. And the danger is that the hinge mount will shift a little bit when you're doing that. You want, you may end up having to loosen one up like I did here and make sure that those screws end up even with the middle of the little aiming notches here or else you're going to have a lot of grief when you go to put the doors on. There's a little bit of adjustability in that to where 
conceivably you could adjust a little bit for the expansion in the wood but when these are brand new out of the box you, you shouldn't be running into that so just make sure that these things are, are centered and the time to do that is as you're tightening it down and if you need to loosen it back up and center it a little bit that's fine too another thing slightly out of sequence with the instructions while you have these things apart on their side it's probably an okay idea to make a decision where your shelf brackets are going to go and then put those in too rather than having to contort yourself into the back of the cabinet or get the spacing wrong on them so we just make sure that they're they're spaced the same and here you know I got the spacing wrong on one so we're going to take that one out and redo it but it's easier to get all that stuff straightened out and corrected before you fully assemble a cabinet rather than after. So I, I don't know why they have that in the instruction to do it afterward, but I think it's better to do it before it's fully assembled. At this stage, the instructions will say to put the cabinet together. What I want to do is I want to kind of conclude everything for the most part with the impact driver, make sure that I've used all the hardware that I need to use at this standpoint. Uh, we've got all of the turn locks in place, make sure that there's none left over see if there's any screws left over. I think I'm going to still uh, need screws or get a hold of some screws for the closet bar mount. And then that's also another situation where you can either put it in an upper mounting position or a lower mounting position. I'm going to be using the upper mounting position on that. But I believe that thing just kind of presses into place and doesn't use any screws. So we're going to hold off on that. On the doors, at this stage in the game, what I want to do is install the hinges. As you can see, everything's kind of pre-cut, pre-set. The hinge can shift a little bit as you're putting it in, but the way it works with these screw heads and the little slots on these, it will kind of self-center as you tighten it down. So you want to tighten, let's say, the top or the bottom, your choice, tighten one of them. And then not, not crank it down super tight, just kind of let it center itself and then tighten down the other one and you'll be good to go. Once you've done that, you need to be really careful where you set these things because if they tip or they move, um, it, it can damage the other stuff. And, and here, you know, we're in somebody's house, so we don't want to, uh, you know, tip or move or scratch or damage anything. So it's your judgment call on whether you want to do that. But remember, like I said earlier, there's instances where if you have two people working in the assembly, you may just want to have somebody else go to the side, do the doors. They're probably going to be done with the doors before the person who's working on the cabinet body is done with the cabinet body. And then when it comes to assembling the cabinet body, that's, that's kind of a two-person situation. In the top and the bottom on this, they're, they're basically identical pieces. You'll notice that there's a bare side of the wood. That's what will face to the rear with the other bare sides of the wood and then get covered up by the back. The other question you may deal with is whether or not you want the turnbuckle, uh, the, the turn lock showing or not showing. On the bottom, I'd say this is a way to do it. Okay. On the top, you could really go either way. And what they show is with these pieces facing the inside, like this. It is possible to fully assemble this thing and have that done with that piece flipped around upside down so that those pieces don't show on the inside. And it's, it's legitimate to do it that way. That piece can work just fine upside down. Uh, you might get a little dust gathering in those things, but then you don't have to look at them on the inside of the furniture. And would give it a slightly more custom furniture look personal preference. So if either one of these pieces goes in upside down, you're not majorly wrong. Although this one, you kind of want the smooth side up in order to have a smooth shelf. Uh, on that one again, you, it could go upside down and you're just fine. As long as the front stays front and the rear stays rear. And that is where the rear ends up being bare wood. We're going to put the turn locks in these and then get to the little bit more careful and delicate operation of putting the other side on. We have the turn locks tight on this. Again, not Gorilla tight. I'll go into more detail on that in a minute. When we put the top on, it's not very heavy. Or, I mean, sorry, the other side on. It's not very heavy, but we do want to be careful with this so that we don't damage anything during the assembly process. We very carefully make sure things are lined up before we 
do anything that's even remotely resembling forcing it in place. We do not use a hammer at any point in this. If it needs to be smacked, you, 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 you press and smack very gently. Uh, nothing hard. This is also a point when you can see this is wobbly. This is a very critical and dangerous point that you don't want to damage the piece as you're working with it at this stage. We're going to get with the turn locks here. And don't use a power tool on these unless you're highly experienced and familiar with a particular power tool that you're using and are confident that it's not so strong it would break these things. Do not use DeWalt 18 volt on these. The Ryobi tool that I brought with me is also a little bit on the power, powerful side for this. I'm going to avoid using it and I'm going to use a Leatherman tool screwdriver. Pretty complex technology in one of these things. But basically, you insert it so that the little open end goes toward the little metal turn base there. We pop that in place. Now there may be a little bit of debris in there. It prevents it from going tight right away. The arrow is going to be pointed toward the piece or toward the little turn lock. We rotate this to lock it. They all seem to stop at a slightly different point depending on the depth everything was done. And we don't get aggressive with it. You, you tighten it but you don't get aggressive with it and definitely don't go power tool tight. Uh, and we do those all basically you know in a linear sequence. You don't necessarily need to do like a lug nut pattern on something like this. But we turn them until they're relatively tight and get all those installed before we even try to move this thing or shift it around because right now it's in a very delicate position. Okay, so there's a few sub-assemblies to deal with on this. This is a bottom leg sub-assembly. Uh, pegs hold these in. We slide those in. We've got this ready to go on and that will go here, okay? The upper leg sub or the upper sub trim sub assembly goes on the front. Now, what we're going to do though, I want to hold off on that because we're going to be tipping this piece back facing its front. And remember how I said it's really delicate at this stage because it could break. Uh, we could break a turnbuckle or, or something like that. But we want to be very careful not to scratch anything when we do this. Hopefully this hadn't been set on anything that was abrasive or sharp. We're setting it like this. We're going to install the back. Assembling the back, uh, what we have is a piece of cardboard here. Several right ways to do, do this depending on how you want it to look or maybe it got damaged at some point. Uh, the kit comes with some nails for doing it right there. and. What I prefer to do is something I've learned from some professional industrial cabinet makers, which is to use a staple gun. Do not, do not use a nail gun on these things. Brad nails uh, are just going to pull right through. They're not going to hold. If you use 18 gauge nails, the problem is that they, they can easily blow through the side of this, even when you have that nail gun turned down all the way to the lowest power. I found that the 18 gauge staple uh, staplers were also pretty risky, uh, the air tools weren't. The only thing that I'm finding really works well with this is this Ryobi unit that is um, normally used for attaching uh, tar paper on like roofs and things like that. What could happen is because this thing's got a little wiggle to it, putting the back on, which is actually the rear is a structural part. It gives us the opportunity to square everything up because this is die cut cardboard. It's very square, it's very straight. So if we need to wiggle or move this around to straighten anything, now is the time to do it. And then so what we do is uh, with a staple gun, hit some corners, preferably close to the edge so that we're not blowing through. And then we hit this corner over here. And with this, Let's see, I'm going to turn the power up a little bit on this thing. You know, I've got a little bit of a sh shiner here if this is a nail gun. Now, it's not the end of the world being on furniture, but it reminds me that I, I need to be pressing this down hard when I do the thing uh, so that we get a good firm, uh, good firm attachment. So here, again, this is it's the back of the furniture. is not super critical, but you can hit a hard point, and you just want to make sure you're pressing down on this hard when you're doing it 
and that's going to give a really good stretch pretension rear that's going to hold square on this. Lots of staples around the perimeter of this. It's it's a lot more rigid, stiff, solid. Now you can kind of move this thing around and do some handling on it. The next stage is to flip it back around to the front. Again, no dragging, no dropping. Uh, be very careful. And uh, try not to have it bridging up on anything so that uh, you, know, you don't have like a single point holding the weight of the unit. And we're going to attach the fascia pieces. Now they stick out, right? But that's not the end of the world because we're, we're going to have doors and that all breaks even with that. So we're very close to the completion at this stage. I just have to use both hands to wiggle these into place. If it's a two-man operation, one person working on the side, the other person working on the other side. So getting the rest of these pieces in the drawers, I, I'm sorry, the shelves. Shelves going in, there are little holes that will correspond to these so that once they're in, it's semi-structural okay a little bit of a bugger to get everything to lock in place uh, these things took a little bit of pressing to lock in place the closet bar is pre-cut to its length so once it snaps in place it's going to stay there and uh, and that's it and and so every additional piece on this starts adding structural integrity to the whole thing which is is going to add strength to it and so once it's everything's in there it starts becoming a much more stiffer and solid feeling piece of furniture it's actually not bad you know so uh, we'll keep going uh, all three of these hinges slid in it's a little tricky to make sure everything ends up even here and before you tighten everything down but these are this is what tightens everything down this is a little bit of an adjustment screw as you can work things in or out Try to be really careful just to leave those on their factory settings. Uh, again, if everything's brand new and being dealt with on that, you should be able to get free movement, everything being even. And if you can do it with one door open, one door close, and just checking everything and tightening it down like this by reaching inside, it's going to work out a little better. Putting the knobs together, this is how they end up. But it's a little trickier than it looks. Basically, you've got a two-piece screw. This little base piece goes into the knob. You see how that goes. And then this piece is what will be going through the door. And then you do you do want to impact type that. Not super powerfully impacted, but you do want to use an impact on that. And again, the trick to getting these things to come out where everything's even, I find, is you set it on there and then have well here this door hasn't been installed yet, but when Tighten down the middle with a close and then make sure that the top does that close. And then you'll probably want to open it up to get the very bottom one. As long as two of these are aligned, the third kind of automatically goes where it should be. Something a little bizarre on this, you might want to have to look out for. And I would say don't deal with it until you're right at the end. But here you can see this is all installed. The knob positions are the same, everything else is the same. Here we have the three holes with the bias downward for this side. And then here we have the three holes. And I had to reposition that hinge to put the bias upward. So apparently these hinges are in slightly different positions. I, I don't see the rhyme or reason for that. If you run into that on your particular build, I would say don't deal with it until right at the end. Don't try to predict which side is going to go which way because you might end up with more of a problem than you started out with. But here we are, we're all done. So I'm going to get a picture for the beginning of the video and we're going to show how this is pretty much the way it needs to look when you're all done.